Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hold. This is our regular weekly message. Today we're finishing up our series entitled The Price of Doing and the Cost of Ignoring. And this is the third part. It's entitled, We Do Not Want This Man to Reign Over Us. Some Christians want to do just to make it in. They just want to skate in unannounced and unaffected, so to speak. They feel that all they have to do is to believe that there's a God, just believe that Jesus exists, that everything's going to be fine and dandy, and they can just make it into heaven. But I don't think a Christian can just believe and make it into heaven like that. They don't have to do anything else. They, they can live however they want. I don't believe that. I believe that there has to be a change, and when there's a change, there's a difference in your life. Then there are those who outright reject Christ and think that they can go unscathed. Nothing will happen to them because, after all, God is dead. God does not exist. There's, Jesus is just a, a, a thing of our imagination. But again, that too is the wrong answer. For those who reject, reject Christ and trample his blood underfoot will pay a heavy, heavy price in the judgment. So let us turn to our scripture, which is found in Luke chapter 19, verse 11 through 27. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. And his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him. And he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall be a, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your miner has made five miners. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your miner, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has the ten miners. And he said to him, Lord, he has ten miners. I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Let's refresh with the servants who did not have anything to show. Because he hid his minor in a handkerchief and he refused to risk it in business and Jesus said to those around take the miner from him and give it to the one who has the ten miners so Jesus is saying that he did not invest the miner therefore he's not worthy of having the miner so take the miner from him and give it to someone who is worthy of the miner give it to the one who has 10 because he worked really hard in, in my fields he worked really hard in the harvest he was the one going around winning souls telling people about me telling people how, how, how I paid the price for sin telling them the way to life I offer life. And Jesus said to those, take it from him. Take the miner from him. He does not deserve it. Give it to the one who does deserve it. 
You see, Jesus wants us. No, no, no. Jesus requires us to work in the harvest field. He does not want to come back and, and, and we find him unaware. He does not want to come back and find us asleep. He does not want us to come back and find us doing whatever it is that we we're doing with no regard to Jesus or the work that he left us to do. Look at what Jesus advised us in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. How can you buy gold without money? How can you buy clothes without cash? How can you buy things? Because Jesus is speaking spiritually here. Jesus said, work in the field. Earn spiritual money so you can buy spiritual things. Things that will last forever because wherever you store up your money, that's where your heart is. Where your heart is, is where your love will be. Where your love will be is where you will spend eternity. So if our love is in heaven, if we're storing up our gifts in heaven, that is where we will work towards. And that's where we will, will eventually spend eternity. And that's what Jesus wants from us. So please understand that Jesus is saying, work hard so you can spy spiritual things. I want you to be awake. I want you to be paying attention because my return is soon. I don't want to come back and find you unawares. I want you to be looking for my return. I want you to build up treasures in heaven. So Jesus does not want to come back and find us sleeping. He does not want to come back and find us naked. See, it is like the pastor who went out to visit his congregation one Saturday. As the story goes, a pastor went out one Saturday afternoon to visit his church members. And at one house, it was obvious that someone was home. He heard the noise in the house. He heard the, the, the rustling and, and, and feet shuffling. And then he began to knock on the door and everything went silent. He knew somebody was there, so he continued to knock. But knock as he made, nobody came to answer the door. So finally the pastor gave up. He took out one of his cards and he wrote on it, Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Now Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now the next morning being Sunday, the card turned up in the offering tray. And right below the pastor's message was written, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Now Genesis chapter 3, verse 10 says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. See, you don't want to be like that church member when Jesus comes back. You don't want Jesus to come back and find you naked. And, and you have to go and hide yourself. You don't want to have to do that. You want to be ready. You want to clothe yourself in the righteousness of Jesus so that your shame and your na nakedness might be hid. Because make no mistake, Jesus is coming back. And he advises us to buy gold from him that has been refined in the fires so that you might be rich, so that I might be rich, so that we might be rich by white garments that we may clothe ourselves and the shame of our nakedness will be hidden. It will not be seen. We might not be ashamed when Jesus comes back. Salve for our eyes that we might see. Jesus wants us to see spiritual things. He wants us to be involved in his, in, in his harvest field. This is not a pop test. This is not a pop quiz. Jesus is warning us again and again, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Look, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. He says, and behold, I am coming back soon. Blessed is the one who holds the words of the prophecy of this book. Again, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Behold, I am coming back soon. 
bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Again, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. He, test, he who testifies to these things said, Surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus warns us at least three times in this one chapter, Revelation chapter 22. Three times alone. He does not want the, the return, his return to sneak up on us. You know, like how we watch the calendar tick down January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Then two weeks from Christmas, you hear from the shout, wow. Christmas just snuck up on me this year. No, Jesus didn't, or, or, or Christmas didn't just sneak up on you. You watch it crawl up. These days, it's rush up because the time is flying by so, so quickly now. It's running up on us, but you saw it coming. It just didn't happen yesterday. November wasn't skipped. October wasn't skipped. It was September, October. Thanksgiving in, 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 in November, and then here we are, Christmas. So Jesus wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be ready. He does not want his return to sneak up on us. Jesus wants us to use the gifts that he gave us. He wants us to use the talents, the resources, the finances. He wants us to use all the gifts that he gave us. He wants us to use it in the wheat fields. He wants us to use that mina that he gave us. God has blessed us to be a blessing. So if Jesus has, has blessed you, and he's blessed every one of us, and you're not being a blessing to somebody else, then you're hiding your minor in a handkerchief. Whatever it is, if it's preaching, if it's teaching, if it's just witnessing, if it's just being there for somebody, if it's finances, sharing your finances, whatever it is, if you're not doing it, you're hiding your minor in a handkerchief. And there are dire consequences for hiding your minor in a handkerchief. Again, God has blessed you with talents. God has blessed you with spiritual gifts that you might be a blessing to somebody else. So use your minor. Now, I want to bring this plane in for our landing and, and skip on down to the last verse. Verse 27. What it says, But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. New York Times published an op-ed April the 15th, 2022. The title of the article was, In this time of war, I propose we give up God. In his essay, Shalom Ashlander, an American author and an essayist with an Orthodox Jewish background wrote, and I want to quote, This weekend, Jews around the world will celebrate the holiday of Passover, the name of which comes from the story of God passing over the homes of our distant ancestors on his way to slaughter the firstborn sons of evil Egyptians. Our forefathers, the story goes, marked their doorposts with lamb's blood in order to spare their own sons the awful fate of their enemies. In this time of war and violence, of oppression and suffering, I propose we pass over something else, God. God, it seems, paints with a wide brush. He paints with a roller. In Egypt, said our rabbi, he even killed firstborn cattle. He killed cows. If he were mortal, the God of Jews, Christians, and Muslims would be dragged to Hague. And yet, we praise him. We emulate him. We implore our children to be like him. Perhaps now, as missiles rain down and the dead are discovered in mass graves, 
is a good time to stop emulating this hateful God. Perhaps we can stop extolling his brutality. Perhaps now is a good time to teach our children to pass over God. To be as unlike him as possible. Why did God kill the firstborn cattle? My rabbi asked. Because of Egyptians believed there were gods. And we humans, made in his image, do the same. With fixed wing bombers and cluster bombs, with self-propelled mortars and thermobaric rocket launchers, killing God is an idea I can get behind. End of quote. There's two things that I want to point out in this article. Number one, it happened during the most holiest Jewish holiday and the most holy Christian holiday. A time when Jewish or uh, uh, the Jews remember their, their, their miraculous deliverance from Egypt and Christians remember the tremendous price Jesus paid for our salvation. This article couldn't come at a worse time. Number two, this is a man who apparently grew up in an orthodox Jewish home with a strong belief in God, and yet he turns his back on his creator and the deliverer of his people and yell, we do not want this man to reign over us. In 2012, apparently, the Democratic Party dropped the name of God from their manifesto. Reporter David Brody of CBN News discovered the omission. He wrote, and again, I want to quote, Guess what? God's name has been removed from the Democratic National Committee platform. The Brody files are called into DNC to explain why God's name has been dropped from the platform. Some critics will suggest that when you have planks in your platform that support abortion rights and gay marriage, then it's no wonder that God's name would be dropped as well. End of quote. You can't serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. There is just no way of serving two masters. In an article entitled, According to Science, God Does Not Exist, on the website learnreligions.com, they wrote, and I quote, it is possible to say that, scientifically, God does not exist. Just as science discounts the existence of a myriad of other alleged beings. End of quote. So, science has figured it all out. God just does not exist. It's all just a figment of our imagination. The peace that he gives you, the peace that he gives me, the peace that he gives us is all in our heads. We have all just imagined the great peace, the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. This peace is just an imagination because it comes from nowhere, from no one according to science. Some people have been divinely healed miraculously healed by the name of Jesus. What about that? Addicts, had their addictions broken by the name of Jesus. What about that? Lives have been totally changed by the power of his name. Relationships have been put back together. Countless people have been freed and set free because of the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And yet they want us to believe that he just doesn't exist. Just so that they can have their own perverted ways, that they can have their own perversions accepted because God does not accept perversion. But I'm here to tell you, they came by a little bit too late to tell us or to convince us that God does not exist. We, we choose to believe that God exists. We choose to believe that Jesus 
came as a baby 2,000 years ago. We choose to believe that he paid the price. We choose to believe that he was wounded, beaten, bruised, and, and nailed to a cross, and was dead, buried for three days, and on the third day he rose again, so that we might live forever with him, so that we would have forgiveness of our sins. We choose to believe that he's coming back for us. See, these people in our scripture said, we do not want this man to reign over us. And that's exactly what the people are saying today. They're shouting, we do not want this man to reign over us. But here's the bitter truth. God does exist. Jesus is coming back. And he is coming back real soon. And all those who have not accepted him as Lord and Savior, all those who have trampled his blood under their feet, will have to answer to Almighty God. All those who have, have said in their hearts, we do not want this man to reign over us, will get their wish. They will get their desire when our Lord Jesus comes back. Because look here. Verse 27, let's read it one more time. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. On his return, Jesus is going to say to those people, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I have no idea who you are. You are not one of my children. You are not one of my brethren. You did not want me to reign over you then. Therefore, I will not reign over you now. Jesus will turn them away and they will go into eternal damnation. The place described as the lake of fire to spend all eternity. He will say, I don't know who you are. I'm sorry. Go to the place that, that, that was designed for the devil and his angels. Now it will be your place because you did not want me to reign over you. You said in your heart, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now you have your wish. I will not reign over you. Go to your eternal destruction and they will go to the lake of fire and there they will spend all eternity. And the sad part is, is that they're treating their little children to say it and their children and their children. And they're leading their whole family astray, leading them to an eternal Eternity in a lake of fire. How sad. It all could be avoided. Because Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. He loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whomsoever believe in him should have eternal life. They should not perish but have eternal life. You don't have to die, but live. It's not Jesus' decision where you spend eternity. It's your decision. A good God, it's true, will never just send you to a place of eternal torment. You must choose that for yourself. God will not just send you there. It has to be your choice. So if you go there, it's your choice. It's not Jesus' choice. You choose where you go when you claim in your own heart, we do not want this man to reign over us. You choose to go there. So have you ever said, I don't want this man to reign over me? Have you put Jesus off? If you have, you're basically saying, I don't want this man to reign over me. If that's you, and you would like to repent, he has made it real, real easy. All you gotta do is to ask. Follow me in this prayer. If you want to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you want to spend eternity with him, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. I am sorry for saying in my heart, I do not want this man to reign over me. I've changed my mind. I've 
I ask you for forgiveness. I want you to reign over me. I want to be in eternity with you. Thank you now for giving me life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do, get a Bible, get a highlighter, begin to read that, your, your Bible every single day. Read it every single day and highlight those verses that are meaningful, those verses that can help you in hard times, times of trial, times of trouble, times of fear. Highlight those verses and learn those verses. Find yourself a Bible-believing church. A, not one of those progressive churches that embraces the world. And, uh, and Any church that's a friend of the world is an enemy to God. So find yourself a Bible-believing church that believes in holiness, that believes that there's a right way and a wrong way to live. Be discipled in that church. Work hard in that church. Win souls for the Lord. When he comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's what we all want to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And we'll, he'll take us to be with him, and there we'll be forever and ever praising his name and living the life that he has created us to live. Thank you so much for joining me and joining us. Um, the Hold the Hope family sends their love to you. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.